Good evening, everybody. I also didn't think I'd get my supper so fast. So enjoy the sandwiches. They're delicious. They could feed an army. Uh, my name is Judah Denberg. I'm a professor at McMaster University, and I'm the scientific director of Allergen, which I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, I really, really want to thank you for joining us uh, and being part of uh, this third public forum. We do them in different cities, different times, on issues related to uh, allergic diseases and asthma and uh, related disorders. So, so the objective this evening is to enable direct dialogue with you and provide, hopefully, good answers to questions you have regarding the September and December asthma spikes. And some of the issues we'll deal with will include prevention, uh, best practices in asthma management. We have a whole group of people who are experts in this. Now, this evening wouldn't be possible uh, with not, without the support directly of the Canadian Institutes for Health Research and their program called Café Scientifique, uh, which are these public fora that we talk about. And the Institute of Infection and Immunity of the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, which is like the Canada's NIH, research body in medical research. This is part of that program and they funded it. Our network partners are also very, very key and they've played a very integral role in tonight's event by extending their help and invitations throughout respective networks. And this is a very nice turnout. Uh, we'd like to thank the Halton Catholic and Public District School Boards, the Halton Region Public Health, uh, uh, Asthma Society of Canada, Ontario Lung Association, and Anaphylaxis Canada for their partnership in this evening. Now you all received, this is your homework, you all received an evaluation form, so on your way in you got it, and on your way out you take that pink colored paper in your gift bag and please fill out, take, take a few moments to fill out the evaluation before you leave. Your comments are very important to us and they'll help us shape other public fora uh, that we're going to host uh, on this and related topics. If you have to leave early, that's fine, but please try to fill out your evaluation, unless you didn't hear anything good or you didn't hear enough to make an evaluation. That, that's fair. So before I introduce tonight's panelists, let me tell you a little bit about allergen. <clears throat> Since 2005, Allergen, which is a network of research funded by the Canadian government, has built experts in a team across this country, experts in asthma, allergy, and immune diseases, who are across some 23 universities in Canada, internationally with many different partners, up to 180 partners, we have hundreds of investigators and even hundreds and hundreds of students and trainees in this network. Allergen's aim is to improve the quality of life for people living with asthma, allergic diseases, and anaphylaxis. And it does this by supporting research, which is key, which will lead to new diagnostic tests, better treatments, better medications, more effective public policies, and better asthma and allergy management and education. These are all key. You can't just do research, you have to translate it into benefit for people in this room and across the world. So we're very pleased and, and privileged tonight to have with us an expert panel that covers that range from research to education and management, a uh, panel of clinicians, researchers, and members of community organizations. Malcolm Sears, right over here, Dr. Malcolm Sears, Dr. Susan Wasserman, next to him. They're both professors at McMaster University. Jul Julia Bruderovich, who's from the Halton Region Public Health School Asthma Program, and we'll tell you more about her in a sec. And Chris Hiromi, from the Ontario Lung Association. Thank you all for joining us this evening. You'll find full biographies of each of our 
expert panelists in your package. We're also very fortunate to have with us representatives from the Halton School Boards. Jackie, I'll, I'll ask the two of you to stand up because you want to come and sit here, but you'll sit with us later. Jackie Oxley, Systems Administrator, Community Engagement, Halton District School Board, and Bob Sirocco, Risk Management Resource Person at the Halton Catholic District School Board. And they'll participate, thank you very much, they'll participate in our Q&A later. Okay, so here we go. I'd like to introduce our first expert panelist, Dr. Malcolm Sears. He's an investigator and a researcher in allergen and outside of allergen. He's a professor, as I told you, at McMaster. He's a director of a very big project that we've launched in Canada that is known around the world called CHILD. It stands for Canadian Healthy Infant Longitudinal Development Study. It's a study of mothers and their children from the time the babies are conceived, from pregnancy on, to see what of all the things, genetics, environment, and all kinds of things, goes into the development of allergies and asthma. He's headed this for many years now, and he's continuing to head a big team of national and international experts in this. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Medicine. He works at the Firestone, uh, uh, renowned Firestone Chest and Allergy Unit at uh, St. Joseph's Healthcare, and he's a well-recognized internationally asthma specialist, clinician scientist, and an epidemiologist. So without further ado, Dr. Malcolm Sears. Thank you very much for the introduction, Judah. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk to people with similar interests. We are all involved in thinking about allergy and asthma and uh, from many different perspectives, whether a family member, a parent, a school teacher, a researcher, a scientist, we all have the same goal of understanding what this is about. So I was asked to talk to you a little bit about these phenomenon that we've seen, which epidemiologists call mini epidemics or peaks. This came to attention several years ago. It's not actually a new phenomenon, but it's been recognized perhaps not so clearly for many, many years. But about seven or eight years ago, one of my epidemiology colleagues came to me and said, I've been looking at the data for hospitalizations of children in Ontario for all sorts of diseases, but there's something very odd, because every September there's this enormous peak when children with asthma are admitted to hospital. There's a bit of a peak in December, but September seems to be uh, a real risk, high risk time. And uh, Neil and I looked at the data over a period of about 15 years, and sure enough, regular as clockwork, every September, there's this enormous increase in hospitalizations for asthma. So we started looking at, I wonder why, what is it in September? Is it the phase of the moon? Is it the ragweed allergies? What is it? And uh, over a series of several years, did a number of investigations, uh, firstly looking at children coming into the emergency rooms in September and at other times of the year, and they all looked the same. They all had bad asthma when they came in, so that didn't help us. Then we looked at specifically the children coming in in September and looking at all sorts of things that were going on in terms of their uh, health and specifically in terms of their asthma and said many of them had had a viral infection. And then the pennies began to drop, and we, said, we looked at the timing of this, and every year the peak of this epidemic was just over two weeks after they went back to school. Now you know that children go back to school the Tuesday after Labor Day, so that shifts. Every year it's a day or two later, and then it jumps back a week, and then it shifts again. And sure enough, when we went through 15 years of data, this peak did exactly the same. Moved by a day and then jumped back. And we said, it's related to Labor Day. Well, it actually is not quite related to Labor Day. It's related to going back to school, which Labor Day is the signal for. We said, why? And uh, there are a number of things, and to cut a very long story short, it turns out that there are multiple factors which cause this. Two of the key ones are children going back to school and sharing their viruses with their friends. Children are very good, as you know. If you're in a family, children share their viruses very effectively. 
They do it three times more effectively than adults do, probably because they're not quite as hygienic and they don't always have the nose in the sleeve. Uh, but children at school can share their viruses, and so particularly the rhinovirus, the common cold virus, spreads rapidly. Now this increase, this peak actually begins before school. It begins in late August. So the, you know, the virus is out there, it's beginning to affect people, but when you get then a few hundred children back together uh, and sharing viruses, it escalates. And the children with asthma are susceptible. And one of the other things we discovered when we looked at some other information on the medications that children use for asthma is that they don't use them as much over the summer. And there's several reasons for that. It's warm, they're outside, uh, they're enjoying life, and many parents want to give their children a holiday from their medications anyway and uh, get them off these uh, uh, regular treatments that otherwise they have to take to keep their asthma under control. But what it means is that children are coming back to school less protected from their medications. So they have less medication, they have a new challenge with the viruses. It's also ragweed and other allergy season, and uh, Dr. Wasserman will talk a little bit more about the allergic side of it. And then maybe even there's also the stress of going back to school, uh, new classes, new teachers, that fear factor which may aggravate some of this. So we put all this together and said this really is a sort of the perfect storm of multiple triggers, multiple factors coming together to worsen asthma at a time when they're not taking regular treatment or as much regular treatment. So the final step of what we did was say, well, can we do anything about it? It's all very well to understand what's going on, but can we actually do anything about it? The advantage of this peak in September is that we know exactly when to do our studies. Okay, next September, we'll do a study on this. And what we did was to use a common asthma medication uh, to give to children who were at risk of asthma, but we only gave it to half of them. The other half got a dummy, or a placebo, that looked the same, tasted the same, and they didn't know which was which, and nor did we, until the study was over. And we gave this for six weeks and said, take this in addition to whatever you normally take for your asthma. And at the end of the study, we found that we had reduced this risk of a bad asthma attack by 80% in those who had a regular medicine during that treatment period time, compared with those who didn't. We also then found out that although many of the children were supposedly taking something regularly, they really weren't. Uh, they take their puffer twice a day, well, some days and maybe only twice a week and maybe not even at all. So by giving them something which was easy to take and take it regularly every day just for six weeks, although that's not the ideal way that we would normally treat asthma, which we need to treat long term. But by doing that in the study, we showed that effective treatment blocks the peak. Similar sort of findings have come from the December peak, which tends to affect more older people, uh, uh, middle-aged adults and people getting into my grey-haired zone, particularly also those who have other forms of lung disease, chronic obstructive lung disease, uh, smoking-related lung disease, they're more at risk of the winter viruses, and so there's another peak there. But the younger children are particularly at risk in the September period, and uh, that's a, a phenomenon which now has actually gained world recognition, and it's called the September peak. Uh, it actually occurs in every northern hemisphere country that we've looked at. It occurs six months out of season in the southern hemisphere. It's the going back to school phenomenon, if you like, where children are exposed to these risk factors. We uh, published an article, published multiple articles, but I put one and it's over on the allergen desk there called Understanding the September Asthma Epidemic. It's written for a medical audience, but hopefully it's readable and understandable. And if you'd like to pick up a copy, there's enough there for you all to pick up a copy if you'd like. So that's my brief introduction to the peaks. I'm happy to hand it back. <clears throat> There'll be lots of time for questions. You're, you're, you're going to incubate the information. But just to show you that Columbo isn't alone in sleuthing and detecting what the cause of something is. I mean, this is really high-level work that has 
achieved international recognition now. It's something that people know about. So thank you very much, Dr. Sears. Uh, our second speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Susan Wasserman, also from McMaster University, a professor in the Department of Medicine as well, a colleague of mine in the Division of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. She's an allergy specialist. She's director of the Adverse Reactions Clinic uh, and a physician also at St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton. And Dr. Wasserman has been doing a lot of work and is affiliated with both the Asthma Society of Canada and Anaphylaxis Canada. So, Dr. Wasserman, thank you very much for coming. So thank you very much, Judah, and I'm also delighted to be here. It's a pleasure to see everybody who's so interested in allergy and asthma. Uh, Dr. Sears gets to do all the interesting research and to give us food for thought as to what may be causing the September peak. And as an allergist who's actually not trained in pediatrics, but internal medicine primarily, most of my practice is now devoted to seeing pediatrics, only because that's where we see so much allergy and asthma. So I certainly get to see the effects uh, of the September peak firsthand within my own clinic. Uh, my feeling is that any asthmatic should be assessed for allergy. And even though the September peak seems to be primarily triggered, uh, by viral infection and a lot of those other factors, including allergy that Malcolm may have mentioned. Uh, to me, it's critical that anybody with asthma be assessed for allergy. To start with, I think it's extremely important just for prognosis of that child. Uh, there are many kids who cough and wheeze. The majority will not go on to develop what we understand to be true asthma as they grow up. But children who seem to be most predisposed to getting asthma, those wheezers who do end up having asthma, are the allergic children. Those are the ones that seem to be most at risk, and it's important to identify them early and to control them uh, as early as possible with good environmental control and certainly medications to treat their disease. So just as a glimpse into the future of a lot of these children who start off symptomatic, it's important uh, to know whether or not they have allergy to see if they develop asthma down the line. The other reason is because uh, allergy is a disease of comorbidities, and asthma is just one expression of that. Uh, we know that many children are allergic, and exposure to those allergens cause worsening asthma. If they have pets at home to which they continue to be exposed, house dust mites during pollen season, often many of them will waver in terms of their asthma control and not do as well. So you've got to identify potential triggers, and the only way to do that is not through guesswork, but by seeing the allergist who can do the proper skin testing, uh, and identify those allergens that may be contributing. Other comorbidities, other sorts of allergic conditions that can occur at the same time and affect asthma are things such as allergic rhinitis, allergic runny nose or hay fever, as well as sinusitis. And it's important to keep those diseases under control in order to have the best possible treatment of the asthma. Many children with asthma also have food allergy. We call this the allergic march. Many children start off having eczema. They then develop food allergy, later allergic rhinitis and asthma. It is especially critical for the food allergic to have properly controlled asthma at all times of year, including the September peak. And the reason for that is because if somebody does have an accidental ingestion of that food, if their asthma is poorly controlled, they tend to tolerate the anaphylaxis less well. And this is where uh, the fatalities that have been described for this problem have occurred in people with poorly controlled asthma. So my job as an allergist is to see children with asthma or other allergic diseases, ask the right questions to determine control at all times of year, not only the September peak when they're most stressed with viral infection. Ask those critical questions. Do they cough at night? Do they wheeze? Do they use their rescue inhaler more frequently? Have they been to hospital? Have they required extra visitation? Every patient that sees me always has their technique assessed with their inhalers. Good technique is critical. Without it, asthma medications don't work. Assess the medications themselves. Treat comorbidities like allergic runny nose. 
uh, and other things which may be contributing, and of course look after the other allergic diseases like food allergy, which they may have. So that's how I see my role. Uh, nobody leaves my clinic generally without a follow-up, and the message is educate, educate. Many of these things are certainly preventable. Uh, or treatable, and most patients can be very well controlled. So I'm going to stop there and hand over, and we'll be happy to address any questions on uh, asthma and the September peak and the role of allergy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Wasserman. So uh, there's a lot uh, there, and really the last few words that Dr. Wasserman gave you educate, educate, educate. These are big public health issues and big education issues, and we're so privileged to have our next two speakers uh, from our community partner organizations. Julia Braderovich has played a key role in helping us to reach this broader community here tonight, but she is a public health nurse and the public health school asthma program coordinator in Halton Region. And joining her is Chris Harami, who's from the Ontario Lung Association. Chris is a certified asthma educator and a respiratory therapist. So these are the people who really deliver the goods to people who are not well. And I want to ask Julia and Chris, uh, they're going to come either in tandem or one after another or together. They have, you have 13 minutes or so, okay? Please, welcome Julia. So good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just going to spend the next couple of uh, minutes talking to you about a public health perspective and what's happening in public health departments. So um, I wanted to start by giving you a little bit of background information. Um, it all started back in the year of 2000. Um, unfortunately, at that time, um, a young man who was 18 years old um, passed away um, because of his asthma. And when Joshua Flewelling passed away, um, there was a coroner's inquest, and um, they did a big investigation to see exactly what led to his death. And based on that coroner's inquest, there was a number of recommendations made, and as a result of that, in January of 2012, um, the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care um, launched a provincial asthma strategy, which is now known as the Ontario Asthma Plan of Action. So the Ontario um, Asthma Plan of Action actually is a strategy that involves a number of different projects, and there's about 13 different projects involved in the strategy, and the Public Health School Asthma Program is one of those initiatives. Like we've heard from our other speakers tonight, over the past two decades, the prevalence of asthma has risen remarkably, and particularly, this has been evident in school-aged children, with approximately 20% of Ontario children between zero and nine years of age being diagnosed with asthma. The Public Health School Asthma Program was developed to create asthma-friendly in supportive schools and childcare centers. So we felt if we could do a good job at educating children about their asthma, then they would become um, more successful self-managers. And if they were doing a good job at controlling their asthma, um, we would see them having less missed days of school, less interruptions to their daily activities, and hopefully using healthcare services um, less often. My program, the um, Public Health School Asthma Program, is funded by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, and it's being implemented in elementary schools and child care centers um, in four different regions. The four regions that have a coordinator are Durham Region, the City of Hamilton, Halton Region, and Sudbury. To help coordinate the four health departments, we do have a provincial coordinator, and that is OFIA. And for those of you um, who are not familiar, that's the Ontario Physical Health and Education Association. So when I have a child care center or a school that's interested in um, taking part in the 
public health asthma program, there are three main services that we can offer them. The first for schools is a student asthma education program. And this is a program um, really focused at children who have asthma, who are in grades two to five. And we um, offer them a curriculum that's based um, out of the Alberta um, Asthma Center, which is called the Roaring Adventures of Puff. The program uses games, crafts, activities to help ch children to learn new skills and to improve their asthma knowledge. When our program started, it was actually a pilot study and um, it showed really successful results. Things such as having an improvement in how children take their asthma medications. They also reported having a better quality of life, so they were sleeping through the night better and also being able to participate in sports and active play. We also saw a reduction in the number of school days that were missed, and we also saw a reduction in the use of urgent health care visits. The other thing that I notice when I go into schools is that parents absolutely love that the service is um, part of the school day. They don't have to go to another hospital appointment or go out to another clinic. The service is right there in the school setting. And the other thing that I've noticed is that the children really respond well to seeing other, other kids in the school that have asthma. The other thing that's really interesting to see is that the kids learn that they're not alone in their chronic condition and um, they actually are very supportive of one another. The second service that we help to deliver to schools and childcare centers is just to provide general asthma education to staff and also to the general population. Our last main component that we help to develop is policy development in schools and in childcare centers. And I'm very happy to say that back in 2007, the Halton District and the Halton Catholic District School Board formed a committee to develop a joint asthma protocol for their schools. The protocol helps to outline the role and responsibility of administrators, teachers, parents and guardians, and students. My program has seven main elements that we would um, hope that childcare centers and schools would implement if they're trying to form an asthma-friendly environment. And I've seen many benefits um, from having a protocol in place. The first one is that the schools have on their medical collection forums um, a question that asks the parents, does your child have asthma? And by having a simple question like that, we are able to identify the kids that have asthma in the school setting and make sure that parents are giving us important information about things such as their triggers, their emergency contact information, and what their medications are. The second thing that the protocol has helped to um, improve is allowing children to carry their own asthma medications while they're at school. And if they're not old enough, um, the protocol states that they should have easy access to them. And lastly, the protocol also has um, helped us to recognize um, teachers, parents, and students what asthma symptoms are and to have a consistent process in managing asthma emergencies. So at this point, I just wanted to highlight a few resources that um, I've brought along with me tonight. Um, I've had the pleasure of sitting on a children's environmental book committee, and um, our environmental specialist here at Halton Region, Becky Jazz, has written um, a couple of books, and they really talk about air quality and pollution, but they've also talked about how those things impact respiratory conditions such as asthma and several of the characters in the books have asthma, so it's a great tool for teaching children um, about asthma management. So the first one is called A Farewell to Feather Wagons, and the second one, which was just launched in June of this year, is called Wings and Thingamajigs. So um, please come by my table tonight. I've brought copies for everybody, and if you have a young person at home, or if you're here as an educator tonight, um, feel free to take a copy with you as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julia. We'll move right on to Chris. Just a couple of <laughs> I understand. 
Yeah, I'll just take a couple of minutes, and we're running behind a bit. I'm from the Lung Association, Ontario Lung Association. I'm a respiratory therapist and uh, certified asthma educator, certified respiratory educator. I've also had asthma my whole life. In 1964, when I was born, there was basically Ventolin, Emerge Department, maybe an oxygen tent, which I was in a few times. Um, so we're kind of fortunate now. We have a, a lot of good, relatively safe, actually generally very safe medications, and it can be managed quite well. So uh, it's not nice to be diagnosed with something, but uh, nowadays we have very good medications for it. So I just want to highlight a couple of things uh, that we have uh, through the Lung Association. We have our First of all, our Asthma Action Helpline, which is now called the Lung Health Information Line, uh, toll-free, Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. Anybody can call if they have questions. We have, um, actually at the Lung Association, a total of eight respiratory therapists who are also certified asthma educators and certified respiratory educators like myself, uh, working on various projects, and three of us are working on the helpline uh, full-time. Uh, we've got uh, materials for children themselves to play with and to learn about asthma. Uh, we've got materials for the parents of children uh, with asthma. This is from the Sick Kids Hospital. Very good, lots of pictures, excellent diagrams. And then if you're more into reading more, uh, Dr. Cavessi's book we have uh, from Chio in Ottawa, uh, much more involved, more detailed. That's very good too. It's also important to uh, keep track of asthma, so we have a diary reform and asthma action plan and a whole bunch of resources. You can see them online at uh, www.on.lung.ca. Uh, you can uh, grab some of our materials. I have a display over there. You can grab some of those. Those are just some of the highlights. Uh, we have all sorts of other materials. You can access through on.lung.ca or call us. Um, if you go to the home page, you'll see order. Uh, backslash view resources. You click on there, you can order whatever materials you want, and uh, we will send them to you. Um, so I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, so if you didn't get a sandwich, or you had a sandwich and you want a cookie, and you're not allergic to it, you can feel free. We're going to have a short 10 minute break at 7.05 on that clock. At 7.15, we're going to reconvene for the main part of the evening that's important to you is questions and answers, discussion with our panel. And if, if at that time you still have food, you can bring it back to the table, have it at the table, or feel free to bring it right now to the table. We'll reconvene at 7.15. Thanks very much. <laughs>